Let's please welcome Professor Stephen Hicks for Human Nature. Thank you, John. All right, one of the great questions uh, concerning us as humans is who are we? Right? So we put that in individualized form. Who am I? What makes me me? And then I look out and I see the rest of you and you see me. We ask of our others, what makes us human beings? We have bodies, but we also have minds. It, is our mind something different from the kind of consciousness or awareness that other animal species have? Is it a matter of difference of degree or difference in kind? So is the body and the mind or the body and the soul, do I have a spirit? When I die, does my spirit separate from my body and have an additional agenda? One kind of question. How much control do I have over who I am and what happens to me? Do I have control over my thoughts, my feelings, my actions? Or am I a product of forces beyond my control that really I have a genetic identity, a biological nature that more or less automatically outs, and who I am is set by biological forces working themselves out? Or am I a product of forces beyond my control, perhaps divine forces that we are all pawns or puppets, and the gods are the puppet masters, and what happens to me is plotted out by the great playwrights in the supernatural dimension, or am I perhaps molded and shaped entirely by social circumstances and you can take the same infant and place it with very different families in different parts of the world and that same individual infant would turn out entirely different. So how much control over myself do I have? At birth, am I born neutral? That I don't have capacities that are going to be developed positively or negatively, but it's a matter of choices, experience, perhaps conditioning, whether I become a good person or a bad person, or is it the case that at birth I am born preset with perhaps sin, an original sin that I didn't acquire by my own actions but is part of my inheritance from my ancestors. So all of these are questions of human nature and they are, of course, perennial questions that philosophers and, of course, all thoughtful human beings engage with. Now, what I want to do is uh, start by plunging into a debate, one of the core debates over human nature, and engage kind of a pre-modern and a modern debate on this issue, the kind of debate that has been going on for centuries and still continues but then position postmodernism as a third alternative to it. So one of our themes of today is often in intellectual discourse and certainly in political and public discourse, we like binaries. You're either left or right, liberal or conservative or whatever. Uh, almost always, that's too superficial, there's always at least three fundamentally positions. So instead of single spectra, I almost always find it's useful to start with a triangle. There's this, that, and the third. So pre-modern, modern, and then we'll add the modern one. Now, where is my clicker? Ah, there we go. <clears throat> now, I've got the second question here, just to uh, as a little bit of a teaser. What is human nature? But that's already to prejudge the question in one way, which is to say there is such a thing as human nature. We need to figure out what that is. And if we're following the scheme of the theme of skepticism, then one of the things that we might be skeptical about is whether there really is such a thing as human nature in the first place, or if we, there is such a thing as human nature, whether we can actually figure it out, and so on. So that's to pull out the implicit. So I want to start with an ancient myth. And if you have your uh, notepads out and your pens ready to go, I am going to put a couple of questions to you and ask you to write your answers down. So. Gyges. This is a story that we get from Plato most famously, but earlier from Herodotus. And the story is that Gyges was a shepherd, a young shepherd boy, some village somewhere in Greece. <clears throat> and his job basically was to take all of the sheep of the village. When 
Spring came, take them up into the mountains, hang out with the sheep. The sheep would make gra graze in the meadows, do sheep stuff all summer. So he's got this very boring, low social, doesn't make much money. He's a young guy, doesn't have much chance with girls. And of course, he smells like a sheep, so uh, an additional obstacle <laughs> as well. But as the legend goes, this right, poor, isolated guy is poking around in some rocks or in some cave, and he comes across a, uh, a skeleton. Uh, some apparent person who has died, looks like it was a warrior a long time ago. And all of this is a skeleton at this point, but he notices that on the finger there is a ring. So he takes the ring off the skeleton. It's a nice gold ring, and it's got a, some sort of jewel stone on it. And he puts it on and he's playing around with it and then he discovers something. That is that when he turns the ring so that the stone is facing inwards, he becomes invisible. And he takes the stone and he can turn it outwards and he becomes visible again. All right, so that's the myth part, but it's a good story. So now Gyges has a ring that can make him invisible whenever he wants. What does Gyges do? That's the first question. What does Gyges do? Now, maybe you've never heard this story before. That's fine. 30 seconds. What does Gyges do? Write it down. Okay, <clears throat> so obviously what Gaijis does is he says, wow, this ring is very powerful. I probably shouldn't mess with this. So he takes the ring off, puts it back on the ring of the skeleton and walks away. All right? No, <laughs> don't be stupid, All right? All right? of course not. The ring is amazing. I can be invisible anytime I want. And that means if I'm clever about it, I can do pretty much anything I want and get away with it. So then the question is, what do I want? And, well, Guy Jesus, a poor young man. And when you're young, you have ambitions. When you're poor, one of your ambitions is not to be poor. If you're a man, well, what do men want? Yes. So he wants stuff. So the first thing he does is, right, forget the sheep, back to where the action is, and anything he wants, he can steal it. Has to be a little bit clever about it right? because he wants stuff. And what's the easiest way to get stuff? Of course, you can work for it, but that's a lot of work. This is the shortcut. So he steals anything he wants. Uh, yeah, he is a man. What do young men want? They want sex. So now he can have sex with any woman he wants. He said again, has to be careful about it. Wait until she's alone, alone wherever, in the house, father's away, brothers are away, have his way. So a series of rapes occur. And uh, <clears throat> he was a poor man, frustrated. And of course, when you're young, People pick on you, you make enemies, and you hate those people. And what do you want to do with the people who just irritate you? For a regular basis, you want to just smack them, right? Yeah. Or even worse, they really get under your skin, and you've been resentful and carrying this grudge for you. just like them to die. So basically, anybody he wants, he can kill them. It feels good. Just kill your enemies. Take them out. So a certain number of people end up dead. So stealing, raping, killing. And why is he doing this? Because he can and because he wants to. And the ring is a metaphor for power. He has the power to do whatever he wants. Now, Gyges is just some guy, but he is a stand-in for 
human nature. He's a human being, and human beings are what human beings are, and we all recognize this. We want stuff. We want to be rich. We want to have lots of sex, and we want to be able to do whatever we want to people we don't like. Now, as the legend has it from Herodotus and Plato, Gyges basically killed his way to the top, right? uh, killed the king, became the king, took the king's wife, and then he has additional to the power of the ring, the power of the state to make people do whatever he wants, all of the riches, all of the women, everything that he wants. And that's the best life possible for a human being. Right? Notice the normative claim there now. So what's the account of human nature that we get here? What is it to be a human being? It's to say that human beings are most constituted by desires. We have built-in desires, and we all have these desires. We are greedy by nature. We want stuff. We are lustful by nature. We want sex as often as we want it. And in social relations, we want to be able to take revenge on our enemies, and there's satisfaction in being able to do so and to have power over other people to make them do whatever we want. And so the ring then is power working in conjunction with human nature. We get certain results. Okay, now obviously this has uh, some huge implications because if we think then that is what human nature is about, <clears throat> what should society be about? Because if that's what human nature is, how are we all going to live with each other? If basically whenever we think we can get away with it, we're just going to steal and rape and kill each other, we're not going to have society. So we immediately then have a moral and a social problem if we think this is a proper account of human nature. And the implication of this is that we're not going to have any sort of a liberal society, because what do liberal societies say? Give people lots of freedom to do whatever they want. Let's empower people. Well, Gyges, Gyges right, has lots of power and lots of freedom, and the results are a disaster. So if this is the correct account of human nature, then the moral and political implication needs to be is not that people need liberty and power, those are dangerous. We need to keep people disempowered. We keep a, need to keep a, an eye on people. After all, why was Gyges not out raping and killing and revenging before? Well, because he didn't have the power to do so. So we need to take power away from people. He was afraid that if he did any of the things that he really wanted to do, he would get caught. And so what we then need to do is make sure that he's always watched, right? that we're all watching each other. Once you take the eyes of people off, which is what the ring does for him. People will, now we all of course know this, right? You're driving down the highway, no cops ahead. Are you going the speed limit? Oh, come on, don't be ridiculous, right? You go as fast as you want to go and you want to go fast. When do you actually obey the law? Ooh. Right, cop, fear clutches your breast, right? You slow down, okay? So the eyes of the cops are on you. Right? And so we need a lot more vigilance right, on people. All right, now that's a view of human nature. And there's something to it. And it's a pregnant one in that it has deep social and political implications. Now this is an ancient Greek myth. Well, what's interesting though is if you go a little further to the east in the Mediterranean, you come to what we now call the Middle East and that is the birth of the three major Western religions, right? Greek civilization gives us, or comes out of in part the myth of Gyges. But if you go further east, you get the birthplace of Judaism, Christianity, and later Islam. And what's fascinating is you get almost exactly the same stories in the founding stories of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what's, what's the story that you get there in the beginning there was God and the Word, and God created the earth. He said, let there be light separating the heavens from the earth, creating all of the animals and the vegetation. And then his final creation, man, not his semi-final creation, man. And then from 
the rib of the male, he makes the female. So you have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden, and everything is beautiful. It's God's creation. And then God says, here's the garden. It's all yours. Do what you want, one exception. The exception is the tree right, of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's interesting, the tree of knowledge. Right? So something about knowledge here. And also knowledge of good and evil, moral knowledge, foundational. So human beings in a certain context. So God then leaves. He's not watching anymore. He goes away. What's the first thing human beings do? Steal. Right? Eve, tree, grab, bite. Adam, here you go, bite. Okay. Right. So what's the first thing Gyges did? when he wasn't being watched and when he can get it stole. Eve, theft. All right. <clears throat> Next generation. Cain and Abel, brotherly love, harmony, no. They're differentially favored. Cain feels slighted, he feels envious. In a fit of rage, he kills his brother Abel. Killing. And then we continue to read Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, and it's just stealing, killing, raping, lying, cheating, defrauding, terrible. Okay. I don't know, you read recently the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah? What an awful story. That's right. So two angels come to visit Lot. Lot takes them in. Apparently all of the men in the entire city come and congregate outside of Lot's house and say, send those two young men out because we want to have sex with them all night. We're going to have some sort of gay sex orgy. Right? And Lot says, no, you can't do that. They are my guests. I will protect them. But I do have two daughters. Right, what if I send them out instead and you have sex with them all night? And the men in this video will say, no, that is not good enough. We want the men. Right, and so another angel apparently sends the signal, says, no, you guys need to get out of Sodom. This is going to get ugly. Right, so they escape. They go up into the, the hills and so forth. And then the daughters apparently are of age, but they're getting lonely. There are no men around anymore. There's just their dad. And so they get him drunk and have sex with him and so forth. Okay. <sighs> right. So it's pretty dark, right? Until we get to the generation of Noah and then God comes back and he looks at what human beings have done and says, you guys are disgusting. <laughs> right? I'm just going to wipe you all out and we're going to, it's a do-over, right? I <laughs> didn't get it right the first time. So then we have basically genocide, right? God wipes out the entire human species and all those other animals except for Noah and his family. There's some redemption that is possible there. But you'll notice that's the same story as Gyges, right? Human nature is negative, dark, conflictual. These are pre-modern stories, but they resonate over the course of the centuries. So is that story true? Do they teach us something about the essential human condition. Because if it's the true, then it seems like some sort of original sin doctrine is correct. That we're born with human nature preset, but it's preset in a non-rational instinct or strong passion emotion direction and when people have the capacity to do so, they will act on those passions, damn the social consequences. All right, so, <clears throat> well, of course, your answer would be yes, that story is true, or no, it's not true. But what would the alternative to that story be? Human beings by nature are passional creatures. What might an alternative be? Uh, shout it out, I think, at this point. 
Okay, we're by nature rational creatures. Okay, good. So we have emotions, but we also have the capacity for reason. And this claim seems to be saying that our rational impulse is weaker than our emotional impulse. So Eve can say, I know in my mind that this is God's property, it's off limits, I shouldn't do that, but it's just so tempting, I can't help it. So passions outweigh reason. So the countervailing claim then would be to say that we do have strong passions, but we also have strong reason, and as human beings, our reason is stronger than our passions. Or it should be, and it can be, right, with proper development. So yes, I might be a man, I want sex, there's a beautiful woman over there, passion inflames me and I just can't resist, I go and I rape her. Or I can say, actually if I wanna have a certain kind of relationship with her, just acting on that passion that way is not going to get me what I really want. And what I really want is maybe something long-term, something more principled, something that actually involves her consent, right? <laughs> and I can recognize that about her, right? and I can channel or control my passions and so forth. And that's actually going to serve my interests better. Okay, a story I like to tell as I start to go on the other side is uh, <clears throat> involves a, a dog I used to have. It was a great dog. It was part uh, Great Dane, part Mastiff. It's a huge animal. It's just sort of about this high. But uh, he had this big, huge Mastiff head and uh, a Great Dane body. But what it meant was that in my kitchen, uh, he was tall enough to see everything that was on the, the counter and all the food that was being prepared. And of course, as the part mass, there just been you know, massive amounts of drool anytime food was involved and a voracious appetite. So he was a smart dog too, though. So the way this would go sometimes is uh, he learned, because he was smart enough, that if there was anything on the counter, off limits. And he respected that. If it fell on the floor, fair game. It was gone. But counters, off limits. So... I'm in the kitchen, I'm making a sandwich, right? there's all the smells, the dog's a little bit hungry, and he's just basically stare down, right? What's going on on the counter? And I see him staring down and just looking back at him, and I say, <clears throat> because of the Great Dane part of him, we called him uh, Hamlet, right? Uh, right uh, uh, so Hamlet, I would say, Hamlet, no, mine, right? Now he doesn't understand English, but he gets it. He knows that sandwich is mine, and it's off limits. Now, there's one pregnant uh, uh, moment that occurred that I always will remember. Making a sandwich, Hamlet is watching the doorbell rings in another room. So I look at Hamlet, he's looking at me, back at the sandwich, and I say, no, right in my, my stern voice. And he acknowledges that. Then I leave the room. I go to the front door, there was some package being delivered. I come back in three minutes. Guess what? Sandwich is gone. Okay. All right. Now, I said at that point, Hamlet, right? Bad dog. Right? And he did kind of cringe a little bit. Right? So he knew that he had done wrong right? in his dog intelligence way. Right? But is Hamlet a bad dog? Right? Most of us would say, well, not really, right? No. But he knew that he wasn't supposed to be taking food off the counter. He knew that that sandwich was mine. But did he really know? And we say that you know, he has some sort of self-control, but that self-control has limits because he's just an animal or he's just a dog in this place. And if you know, part of the, uh, his keeping himself under control depends on external agency, there's an authority figure, namely me, keeping an eye on him, and monitoring him and reminding him that he's not supposed to, then he has that level of control. But if I leave the room, I take myself out of the position, I'm like God leaving the Garden of Eden, well then of course, what's going to happen? Animal nature is going to out, right? He has hunger needs, hunger drives, the smells. And once you remove the external authoritative vigilant agency, that's just going to go out. So we don't blame him, he's not a bad dog, he's just doing what dogs do. Okay. Now, the contrast I like, I remember telling this story to my brother one time he was visiting, and he was actually kind of sitting on a stool close to where Hamlet typically perched over right, the counter. 
And so I remember telling him about Hamlet and the sandwich story and so forth. And so the, the variation on this, though, would be that my brother's name is Craig, and he also is a hungry guy. He's, you know, he can, he can eat like an animal, too, sometimes. He's kind of a hardworking Canadian construction guy. So I'm making a sandwich on the counter, right? And Craig is looking at my sandwich. And I'm looking at him and saying, this is my sandwich, All right? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. So doorbell rings. <laughs> I give him one more significant look, and I leave. Okay, Come back in three minutes, and the sandwich had better be there. Right? And it would be there, right? unless my brother, well, actually, this is my brother, so I'm pretty sure the sandwich would still be there. Right? Okay, But what's the difference? You know, if I came back and the sandwich was gone, I said, bad Craig. Right? Well, he would be bad in a way that is different from the way Hamlet the dog is bad. And what's the difference? We expect more from a human being. A human being might have the same biological and psychological drives that a dog would have. At least an adult. That's right, an adult human being. So absolutely, these are going to be developmental, right? If it was a four-year-old child or a 10-year-old child, right, we would have different expectations. But by the time you are a fully developed human being, you will have all of those passions, but you also will be rational, and that rationality has power over your drives, and you should, as a matter of principle, recognize when you can unleash your drives and when you need to restrain or redirect your drives. So human nature is, yes, to have passions, just like the Gaiji story says, but the more important thing is that human beings have rationality and rationality is powerful. We can use our rationality to shape our desires, to shape our actions, and that is the most important fact about human beings. So what we have then is one of the big debates, which is to say, on the one hand, and this is a dominantly pre-modern position, that human beings are not fundamentally rational. They're fundamentally passional. Reason is a weaker capacity. It exists but human beings are primarily driven by their passions. And then a more modern position that says human beings have passions, but those passions are to a large extent malleable and shapeable by our thoughts and our beliefs, and reason is efficacious and powerful and able to grasp principles and regulate our thoughts and beliefs in terms of those abstract principles that we can create. So we're long-term moral agents, not short-term passion-driven agents. Okay, so <clears throat> which one is true? Well, obviously, a long debate. Um, just a comment to that, it seems to me that the most powerful statement of that in the Old Testament is uh, the Ten Commandments. And the first half is all about pleasing to God, and the second half is all about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Yes. Yes, that's right. right. And they are uh, issued as commands. Yeah. That's right. So, and, but they are principles to guide all of your actions. So in the issue of questing, the, the question that uh, speaks directly to here is, where does the enforcement of those commands come from? And so if you then say, we have now then reached a position where we can articulate, and this is a significant moral development, right, to say, here we have a number of moral principles, and we're going to put them in a code, and we think that people can actually learn them. But then there's a follow-up question, where is the regulation or the enforcement of that going to come from? Do you think that it's not just to give the people the code, and they will follow it of their own accord? Because they can say, yeah, I can see that those are true, those are important, and I will follow it. I don't need the police or social enforcement or the eyes of God to be on me to make me do the right thing. Or do you think that, yes, you give people the code, their reason can recognize what those things are, but they still are going to be sinful if they're not monitored. So I think also important is uh, from that point onward, all through, you still have uh, fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord. And so that then is to say, you know what you need to do, like Hamlet, the dog, but we can't expect you unless you think that God's eyes are watching you to follow those things. So you better... Be aware that the eyes of God are always 
watching you and he's keeping a list, that sort of thing. All right, now let's uh, try to update this. <clears throat> I wanna put this in uh, more contemporary 20th century philosophical language. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre, French existentialist who fed into some of postmoderns. Foucault saw Sartre as a kind of mentor figure. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great German philosopher of the late 19th century, every single postmodern will cite Nietzsche and see themselves as significantly following in Nietzsche's footstep. At one point, Foucault in an interview said, you know, really, I'm just a Nietzschean. Right. And, uh, and, and I, I apply my understanding of Nietzsche's text to uh, trying to understand social dynamics. But the older view is to say, if we want to understand human nature, what we should under do, understand human nature as is uh, human beings are created by God. So we take some sort of divine creation understanding and the modern language that we would use, or the philosophical language would be, that's actually not modern, sorry about that. It's a, some technical language has been in philosophy for a long time, is to say, you want to understand what a human being is, you have to understand that their essence precedes their existence. Now, what does that mean? Well, what is your essence? What is it to, to be a human being? And the claim is going to be then that we are all human beings, despite all of our differences and variations in height, color, shape, interest, right, and so forth. There is an essential humanity that we all share, something that is the same in all of us. And that's what we spot and respond and define ourselves in terms of when we are defining what it is to be a human being. And that essence comes from God. Now, you might call it a soul, or you might call it a spirit, or whatever, but the idea is, if you take the uh, Genesis account of creation, God took the dust of the earth, right, and he breathed into it. Well, what's he breathing into it? Well, again, that's metaphor for some aspect of him. He is a soul, or a spiritual being, so he's transferring some of his essence into this shaped dust that in the shape of a human body, that's when the human being comes to life and you've got the full human being. But the idea then though is that the human being comes into existence, but before the human existence, the essence of what it was to be a human being was already there. Now another way to think of this is in terms of God creates human beings for a purpose. He makes them in his image, but for a reason, he has a plan, he has a purpose, there's a reason why he created each and every one of us. So that then is to say he has an idea or a, a, a plan or a blueprint or a template that is going to be the same for all of us and that he's going to then create us in image of that plan. So like an architect's blueprints, for example, first they exist in the mind of the architect, then that blueprint is brought into existence by the builders. So what this house was to be all about and its purpose and its design and its features existed first before there actually was a house. And then the house comes into existence with an essence already built into it. So the original claim then is we understand ourselves by reference to this essence that is the same for all of us, but comes from a divine source. Now the claim then is as we get into the modern world, Friedrich Nietzsche, we become more rational, we become more scientific, we start to believe as many intellectuals do, that there's not really good arguments for the existence of God and so religious belief systems start to decline, we're much more scientific and rational and at a certain point as Nietzsche puts it, God is dead. Now what he means by that is to say that we used to be religious but really we don't believe in that stuff anymore. Right? Even people who think of themselves as pretty religious are not that religious by old standards. So God and our belief in God is dead. So why are we here? If it's not the case that we exist, but there is a reason why we exist, that we have a calling or we have a purpose or there's an ultimate meaning of life that has already been set by a God-like creature and that we're all here to fulfill God's plan in the world, then the implication is going to be on the next generation, and this is the existentialist position, 
and why they call it existentialism, is that we're just here. We just come into existence through random chance processes, but not for any particular purpose. There is no reason why you are here. There is no purpose. You have no essence. Instead, you just exist as a bundle of potentialities, who you become, what your values are, and even collectively what our purposes are. Those things come later. We then exist, and it's then going to be up to us as we grapple with and try various things in existence, what our purposes are, what our values are, what our meanings are. So in effect, we become the gods of our own life and we have to create our essence by means of the commitments and habits that we develop. All right, so that then is to say there is no human nature. There is no meaning to life, no meaning to the universe. It's just a brute fact. So then what we have is a claim that's different from either the claim that we come into existence and we're formed by certain desires that are inbuilt to us and they're all the same, versus saying we also have a capacity for rationality and we all have this capacity for rationality and that we should use it to identify certain principles that are true about human social relationships and govern our actions as individuals in terms of moral responsibility in those directions to say, no, there is no such thing. We're just here, and plasticine can become anything. There are no set purposes, including rational purposes and so forth. Anything goes. So I've got a quotation here from a perceptive postmodern critic <clears throat> in some harsh language here, in the postmodernist perspective, modern subjectivity in all its concrete forms and manifestations as person. And again, there's a whole bunch of things there, which just go to the end. Practically at the end of its tether, if not already defunct. So this question about what a human being is, we're going to say all of the previous answers are done, don't. Done. So we can't talk about persons. So it's not like you're born with a personality. Individuals. You're not really even an individual. You're some sort of just undifferentiated potentiality. You don't have any individual essence yet. Self. There is no self. Emotions. Ideas. Again, it's indeterminate. Race. Cogitans, the Latin, thinking, being. If we try to identify thinking as uh, an essential human capacity that we all share, no. As moral agent, that we all have a capacity inbuilt as part of our human being to regulate our own thoughts, behaviors, actions, and so forth, no. As aesthetic subject, being able to appreciate aesthetic qualities, as author, or something with agency I can create, right? as bearer of human rights. So the modern world has all been about all human beings have, by nature, certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, or whatever your list right might be. Or if you are religious, that all human beings have inherent moral worth as creatures of God. No. All of that is theoretically and practically at the end of its tether, if not already defunct. So the pre-modern and the modern debate has reached the end of the road and we need to get somewhere else. So we've totally dissolved any understanding of what the human being is. So what do we replace that with? Well, here's Leotard, another one, just to sample <clears throat> this book's purpose. This is the Postmodern Condition, the first book published by a leading thinker in this school who's giving the name, right, postmodernism to the, this is in the 80s. This book's purpose right, is to destroy a belief that still underlies much research, namely that humanity as a collective universal, there is some sort of universal human nature as a subject that seeks its common emancipation, right, that we have a core value, emancipation or freedom 
that we want to express. There is no such thing. Right? That's what the modern world has been largely about. We have to destroy that belief. Another quotation, right? Postmodernism, and again, it's a negativity, right? is the dissolution of subjectivity into overarching structures and systems. Okay, so dissolution, right? negativity. All right, now, <clears throat> what do we mean by the dissolution into overarching structures and systems? Okay. And the point is going to be that this is what we're going to work on next, but I will leave this as a question uh, in a moment for you to try to grapple with what might that mean. But notice what we have is a pre-modern position that says perhaps we should be subject to God and understand ourselves as creation of God and that God has given us moral purposes and meanings and the point of being a human subject is to realize in some sense your God-given identity or that you are, in a more modern phrase, born a unique human individual with a, your own mind and your own body and you should develop yourself in order to be able to flourish in the world and because we're rational we can identify principles that are going to, if we all adopt those, enable us mutually to flourish and progress. So if we're going to dissolve either of those understandings into overarching structures and systems, and here's the question, what structures and what systems are we talking about? What might that mean? All right, so take a, a minute, and try to unpack that. Okay, what I'm going to argue next is that this is code for an attack on any sort of individualism right, whatsoever. And that by the time we get to the generations of the postmoderns in the middle part of the 20th century, from a variety of sources in philosophy and related disciplines, any philosophical understanding of human beings as individuals, either as bearers of unique souls that come from God, or as unique individual rational agents with their own minds is to be rejected. So both the pre-modern and the modern understanding. And what will be replacing that is a thoroughgoing collectivity that is captured and instituted by various structures. Now, a number of forms here. So I want to talk through the kinds of theoretical perspectives, and some of them are political, some of them are not political, but this is a pre-political impulse primarily. Obviously, uh, Karl Marx is a giant on the landscape, right? the connection between Marxism, neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, and so on, and postmodernism is, uh, is very important here, but the important point here for this issue is that Marx is an advocate of a thoroughgoing economic determinism. So human beings are born into different economic classes, but you are born, and, and Marx explicitly says, there is no human nature. Right? Everything is acculturated, and people that are born into different economic circumstances become dramatically differently shaped to believe different things are true about the world, to believe different values about the world. And that then is why Marx then wants to argue if you are born into the working class or if you're born into the property class, those two classes, the children get shaped completely differently from each other. That the members of the property class believe they have the right to control the property, the unproperty class and the working class believes that they have the right to the means of production, 
Uh, they have the right to more wealth. But because those two classes are constructed in terms of their intellectual and moral beliefs by different circumstances, there's no way rationally for the two to talk over their differences and reach a common ground, which is why then the Marxists will say, if we are going to bring about the socialist revolution, it has to be by violent methods, because you can't change people's minds through democratic and liberal processes and so forth. So they think a certain way, we think a certain way, our interests and their interests are in conflict with each other, and so it's simply going to be a power struggle. We will rise up, overthrow them, and then just institute our value framework on society. So that then is to say it's economic determinism, but you're born into an economic class, and you as an individual are shaped entirely by your economic class membership. There is no individuality. All right, so that's one important strain that the postmoderns are going to, going to adopt. John Dewey, not a communist, although a fellow traveler, a kind of collectivist, a kind of socialist. He did go over to the Soviet Union and was favorably impressed in the 1920s by what he saw there. Uh, he did come back, though he did have some, some later thoughts, but deeply a collectivist in his philosophical approach. And for him, democracy, it means not only that on certain political matters, uh, since we all are individuals who have different ideas, uh, what we should do is have big debates and then just let the majority decide temporarily what uh, policy is going to be. Uh, for him, democracy is a deeper concept. Who you are and what your values are and what your understanding of the world should be a democratic process. And so when he, uh, in his educational system, uh, uh, is designing new schools, what uh, Dewey and his followers typically will argue is that individuals should never work alone uh, on projects. Instead, you should always have people working in group projects, and it should be a group consensus that uh, decides what the project is going to be from the school children, and there should be group grading and, and so forth. So democracy is a deep process. That's how we decide what is true. So individuals should see themselves as a member of the community first and foremost and go along with the group. So I've got a quotation from him here. John Dewey, right, what is it really to belong to a group in a, particularly in a, in a democracy? Individuals do not even compose a social group because they all work for a common end. So we're sort of picking up a previous sentence. Well, we have a common end. So it's not the case that you have your goals, your dreams, your life, and sometimes we'll form groups temporarily to achieve certain common purposes here. That's not what I mean as John Dewey as a group. So it's not the case that just that we have a particular end and we're all working for that common end. And he gives an analogy. He says, well, look, a machine. A machine is not a group, even though all of the parts of the machine are designed and put together to achieve a common end, namely to make you know, the, the, the turbine or make the car go in a certain direction and so. The parts of a machine work with maximum of cooperativeness for a common result, but they do not form a community. If, however, they were all cognizant of the common end, so there's a common end and all of us need to know what that common end is, and we're all interested in it. We all then say, yes, I am interested in achieving that common end. And we all regulate our specific activity in view of that common end. Then they will form a community. That's what it is to be a member of a communal organization. All of us should strive for this, and this is what the purpose of education should be. So what we then have is, this is not a Marxist right, arguing as a matter of economic determinism that collectivism is true with its implication. This is a moral collectivism, that yes, we might start off at different starting points, but that's not what it is properly to be a member of a society. You set aside your individuality, and we together find a common end and all pursue it together. Sapir Whorf and language. There's a famous hypothesis in linguistics that says human beings are collective creatures, not because of economic reasons, 
not because of Dewey and moral reasons, but because of the way we learn language. There are all of these different language groups out there, each with their own syntax and semantics, so different grammatical structures that are out there. And the claim then is that built into those different language groups is a different worldview. Different languages carve up the world in different ways. So when we are born, obviously we don't know any language yet. Our minds are plastic and we could learn any particular language. But each of us is born into a language community and we are in effect conditioned to learn that language, which then is to say that an entire worldview comes packaged with the language that we learn. And so we are in our very thinking conditioned to be part of a collective. Individual con thinking is merely a matter of playing around at the margins within an already collectivized linguistic structure. And then of course, what the postmoderns will add to this is to say the different languages carve up the world in different ways, and so people really ultimately can't communicate with each other on the deep and important matters. So uh, uh, translation becomes very fraught. You can kind of sort of do translations, but not really. And so people are divided into different collectivities with tensions that are going to be inescapable because you can't think your way out of the linguistic framework that you are born into. Developed in the early mid part of the 20th century, also informative on postmoderns, particularly the deconstructionists who are uh, then saying, well, language and poetry and so forth, they're all about language, that we take this thesis and it's going to have some, some serious implications. Solomon Ash, uh, social psychologist, very interesting set of psychological experiments arguing that as a matter of fact, individuality is uh, a very weak trait in human beings. So we want to say, as uh, uh, perhaps as religious people, you have a soul and you have a conscience and you know what God wants you to do. And so you should screw up your personal integrity and resist temptations and do the right thing. And that's part of moral agency. The moderns will say we have the capacity for, uh, for rationality and for autonomy to make up our own minds, what we are going to believe, and to conduct our affairs as moral agents using our rational capacity, which we think is pretty darn strong. So individual autonomy and uh, individual uh, being an individual uh, um, uh, bearer of moral rights becomes very important in that tradition. Does the social psychology evidence bear this out, or is it the case that really we are more deeply social and collective creatures by social nature? So Solomon Ash was a psychology professor. Um, he did some fascinating experiments on college students, uh, university students in America. And this is an interesting because in the United States, of course, it's a culture that uh, has a reputation for being very individualistic and so on. So the, the results that we get from American university students is, uh, is especially striking. So what he would do is he would say to his introductory psychology classes is, uh, I'm doing some uh, psychological research and uh, you know, I'll pay you a couple of bucks if you will you know, show up in our lab and we're going to do some, some experiments on, on psychology and you won't get hurt, don't worry about that. So just show up. So lots of, of course, poor college students will show up. And what he would say is what we're going to do, and I was just imagine uh, is I'm going to ask you to uh, sit on this chair here, and I'm going to, on the screen, I'm going to be uh, displaying some images. And in each case, there's just going to be two, two objects displayed on the screen. And what I want you to do is say, are those two objects the same, or can you notice a difference? Because what we're trying to do is play around with the psychology of perception and figure out what people can and can't notice. Uh, using their perceptual faculties. So two images, just tell me, are they the same or not? I don't have the chairs for this. He says, but just to speed the process up, we're going to do uh, students in batches of three. So there'd be two other chairs here, one on either side. You would put the test subject in the middle and you would give those people the same instructions. Now, in fact, these two people sitting in these chairs are working with Professor Ash. They're not test subjects, even though they look like college students. And what they have been instructed is, no matter what is displayed on the screen, say that they look the same. Even when things that are different are displayed, say that they are the same. So you start, you know, you have two lines and you put the two lines up on the screen and they're the same length and, you know, 
or I can see, I look at, oh yeah, they're the same. And then these people on either side of me say, they are the same. And I say, they're the same. I might put, you know, two red boxes on the screen that are the same. And these guys say they're the same. And so this person says the same. And then the experiment really begins. You put, say, two triangles and one of the triangles, they're both green, but it clearly is a different shade of green. And then these two say, those are identical. What does this person say? They're the same. Yeah. Well over 90% of all people in that situation will say it's the same. Now, what's going on? That's the question. They can see with their own eyes. And you know they can see with their own eyes. And nothing is going to happen to them right? if they say what they know is true. But it's something like it's two against one, right? And I can't go against the group. I can't go against the majority. And it's, right, I'm overwhelmingly then, the conclusion going to be, a product of the group. And my primary impulse is to fit in with the group, even if that involves overriding and suppressing my independent judgment of the facts. Now, what's also interesting is they would uh, film this, so they would have secretly filmed, and then they would start to play around with the dimensions. So how big do the differences on the things being projected need to be before the person will, in fact, say they're different? Right? And it reaches points of absurdity. And what's interesting is uh, you, you can see the people's faces. You can see the tension that's in their faces. So they look at the screen. They can see it's different. They're about to say, and then they hear it's the same, and their face changes. What? What? And then it's like stress, right? What do I say? Right? And then, uh, and then eventually they will break down, and but they will say things like, "I'm sorry," right? But they're different. Right? <laughs> okay. So this, you have to apologize, right, for pointing out something that's just blindingly obvious. And these are American kids who have been for generations, right, taught, be your own person, do your own dream, sometimes stick it to the man, right, and so on, okay. Even they. So the claim then is that we are by nature, and this is a psychology issue, obviously, conformist, we want to be part of the collective, and that shapes right, our, our thinking. So fascinating, right, studies. And I'll skip over this next one, Skinner, right, and behaviorism, because we uh, came up earlier in response to an earlier question. The dominance of behaviorism, particularly in the, um, uh, the, the American and Anglo-American speaking psychological world by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century. So the point is going to be, if we run through all of this, the high profile of Marxism in the 20th century, the prominence of Dewey's pragmatism, again, in the first half of the 20th century. The Sapir-Whorf linguistic hypothesis, prominent in the middle, by the middle part of the 20th century. The Ash and Conformity experiments and behaviors. Now, none of these are necessarily in agreement with each other, but they do share one common theme. There is no individuality. And so if you are then a well-educated person, keeping up on all of the trends going on in 20th century intellectual life, this is what you come to believe. So individualism, moral agency, self-responsibility, universal rights, all of that seems passe. We need to be post-modern. All right. <clears throat> now I want to, uh, interestingly, <clears throat> make a slightly sideways connection. This is a connection for activism and for policy. So if you are a modern individualist, then what you say is that your activism should amount to gathering data, gathering facts, good charts, making arguments, listening to counter arguments, speak to people as individuals, respect that they have to go through a process themselves. That's how you will engage in your activism. But if you think that this portrayal of human nature that we have is fundamental, that human beings are deeply collective, then you're going to need very different activist tools and your rhetoric is going to become entirely different. 
Now, a striking thing is that most of the postmoderns are coming out of the left, particularly in the first two generations or so. I don't want to steal too much thunder from later, but all of the leading postmodernists are deeply inspired by Marxist political philosophy. Um, <clears throat> but it's not only the far left that is attacking individualism. And so I've got an interesting quotation from a soci sociologist, uh, Karl Mannheim. This is published in 1943 about what was going on on the far right and why fascistic, national socialistic Nazism was also using many of the same tactics. And that was because in their understanding of human nature, reading all of the same literature, they had said, Human beings are not individuals, and so we need to use very different activist and rhetorical methods in order to achieve our ends. So this is Mannheim, a German sociologist. Hitler has developed or invented rather a new method, which could be called Nazi group strategy. The main point about Hitler's psychological strategy is that he never approaches the individual as a person but always as a member of a social group. So what Hitler does instinctively is in keeping with the discoveries of most modern sociology and all of the other ones, namely that man is most easily influenced through his group ties. Okay, so the postmoderns with their collectivity, with their organizing people, into groups with the dissolution of the individual, with a complete rejection of individual moral agency, with the consequent rejection of the idea that uh, we need to treat the individuals uh, as having minds of their own and tolerate differences of opinion. All of that then is flowing out of the high academic literature and given an activist formation. So the question then is going to be what kind of psychology what kind of uh, understanding of human nature will be necessary to reinvigorate a rational individualistic understanding of human beings or an individual soul that comes from God in the light of this argument. Okay, I wanna leave room for questions, so I will draw a line there. Chair over here. Hello, so, Ben, nice to uh, be here. Uh, I just wanted to try and get something straight in my mind. Um, if the postmodernists say there's no truth, how do they then get to the position that these overarching structures are valid? <laughs> Good. So one thing then you can say is, well, it seems like there's a lot of uh, science of psychology and sociology and economic analysis and so forth going into reaching this universal conclusion that all human beings are primarily collective beings and, and socially conditioned. But then that doesn't seem to work with the epistemology of, uh, of, uh, of skepticism and it all just being a, a narrative. So what they will then say is, uh, you're right. Um, I'm not necessarily then going to say that this is true, but uh, it's where I am. And they will then typically just take a negative approach. Say that all of the things that you say on the other side, it will just be a critical approach that supports any belief in a soul that comes from God or an autonomous mind that can think for itself or a moral agency that can direct its course I am just convinced by what I've read that says all of that is undercut, all of that is a fraud. And so what seems to be more natural is uh, just human beings are pushed around by group forces of various sorts. So uh, whether then you push me on that and then say, well, are you saying that that's scientifically true? Then I think they would just say no. But uh, we're getting away from theorizing and we're just at this point going for activism. So it's not a satisfactory answer, but uh, I think the point about postmodernism ultimately going to be that a skeptic isn't going to give you a satisfactory answer. They're just going to defer it and go with 
what they wanted to go with. Now, I want to uh, just, uh, there's one interesting thing. I didn't uh, put the quote up on there, but you're, you're reminding me of this, is uh, Mussolini. I've got a quotation from Mussolini a little bit later uh, on this point. And uh, Mussolini has a, a, a deserved reputation for being a bad guy, you know, absolutely, and all of that. <laughs> That's fine. But also for being a bit of a buffoon, right? So we see him standing, right, wearing this kind of military costume, right, and so on. But he actually was a very smart guy, and uh, before uh, he became a politician, wrote and co-wrote with philosophy professors and other leading intellectuals some very serious works. And uh, one of the things that he wrote in his works was about his conversion from being a Marxist to being a fascist. And for his perspective, it wasn't that big a move. So he was, when he was a young guy, very well educated, read all of the stuff, was a Socialist Party activist in Italy, believed that some sort of Marxist revolution was in the offing, and so he believed all of that. He's organizing the workers, he's writing journalism, and he believes that the universal, uh, that Marxism is a universal program that is going to come. And then World War I happens, and he's shocked by World War I. Because instead of all of the workers all over Europe, the German workers and the Austrian workers and the British workers and the French workers and the Portuguese workers, realizing that they all had these shared universal values and that they were all equally oppressed by the rich capitalist class, what happened in World War I was that the Italian workers were all gung-ho for Italy. And all the Austrian workers and all the Portuguese workers and the British workers were gung-ho for not an international workers' collective, but for their national collective. And they're willing to die for their ethnic grouping. And so what Mussolini then says is, well, everything was right in Marxism, except they got the collectives wrong, right? that we are first and foremost shaped by not our economic interests, but rather our ethnic interests. So being Italian is more important, or being German is more important, or being French is more important. And so what he then says is, and this is what fascism is going to be, instead of international universal socialism, we need to have socialism for Italians. Italians is the right grouping. It's a national socialism that we have to go for. And so far right and far left, not that far apart from each other. They're both just variations on collectivism. What collective are you talking about? Well, then we can have a debate. But all of them, or both of them rather, are opposed to any sort of individualistic liberal democracy. Stephen, the, um, <clears throat> the neuroscientists um, have talked a lot about and seems to be pretty universally held that the individual doesn't have any free will. Yeah. Um, how does that sort of bleed into the postmodernist position? Yes, fair enough. So the, uh, the uh, postmodernists typically come out not out of a biological basis, but they typically come out of these more sociological understandings of what, what shapes us, our language, our economic groupings, right, and so forth. So you're right, there is another form of determinism that's prevalent in the modern world, and that is a biologically based determinism. And typically, most neuroscientists do want to go uh, uh, in terms of a, an understanding that there is no such thing as moral agency or volition or free will. What I would say is a variation on the question about psychology, and that is to say that neuroscience is a very new science. The amount that we don't know about the brain vastly outstrips what we do know about the brain. So what I think is happening in the neuroscientists is that they are modernists of a certain sort, but they are over-eager modernists ready to generalize beyond what the evidence currently supports. So they, uh, the development of self-regulating systems, which is what volition or free will is going to amount to, I don't see anything, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've read a lot of the literature, I don't see anything in the literature that supports the conclusion that there isn't right, such a thing. So I think it's early days of science, they're just getting too, uh, too far. What they have is, uh, uh, this is the way science awfully goes, is you have you know, fairly simple models that you can wrap your head around and the experimental data supports, and you want to overgeneralize those simple models, and the next generation comes along and says, well, no, there's other variables, and so you develop more complex models. So, but I think what the, the, the neuroscientists are trying to do is to say, we have an understanding of certain 
processes in the brain, uh, and they're overgeneralizing to eliminate certain kinds of self-regulatory processes. So, if, but if you think just as a, as a psychological self, what does, what does free will or volition amount to, and what would the research program be? So when we start talking about free will, what we typically mean in, is certain things like, I have a certain level of consciousness going on, and I can all by myself kind of raise or lower my level of control or, or, or focus. That's one aspect of free will. So we're all sitting here right now, and I can say, I'm going to pay attention. Right? Or I can say, I'm going to let myself drift into passiveness. So that's one thing. Another thing we can do, we say as a subject of self-regulation is, there's any number of things in my visual field, in my auditory field, kicking around in my head, is I can say, I'm going to concentrate on this one and block out certain other ones. That's a matter of volitional control. So that's a second aspect. So where do you direct your attention? How intense is your attention or not? And a third one is, uh, seems to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the throwing the switch, so to speak. That one of the things that we seem to be able to do is just think inside our heads, but with no action component. But then at a certain point to make what we call a decision, I'm gonna take that idea and act on it. So here I am sitting in this chair and I'm thinking maybe in five seconds I'll stand up. And, or maybe I won't. Okay. And then I will just say, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stand up, okay? All right, so degree of concentration, what you're focusing on, and then action. So. Then the question would be, what kind of brain structures could have evolved that would support those kinds of self-regulation? And we know there are mechanical models, you know, there are rheostats, rheostats that can be turned up or turned down. And then the question would be, you know, whether inside our heads we can have an internal consciousness rheostat that we are able to turn the dial up or down on. Or we all know that you, know, you can have a camera on a swivel <laughs> and move it around. Is, there, or is it possible in terms of choosing focus uh, you know, that we have an internal control module that enables us to swivel where our consciousness goes? From cars, we know that there are uh, standard transmissions, so you can have the, the clutch depressed and you can be just revving the engine and stirring the steering wheel, but nothing is happening. But you can also engage the clutch and then the action, the car starts to move. So is there a physical neuroscientific possible model that's in effect a, a brain clutch that we are in control of? Now, I'm not a brain scientist. I'm a philosopher who thinks about volition, right, sometimes. But from my understanding, there's no good basis for saying none of those self-control modules that we just talked about are physically impossible. They're all causal mechanisms and so on. So I would say just uh, be a little more modest neuroscientist and don't, don't get there too, too quickly, something like that. I think there was also a hand back here, but yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you, you haven't asked a question yet, so go, please go ahead. I wanted to know if uh, philosophers are not to pursue realism and truth and knowledge, what is their purpose in a postmodern world? Do, do postmodernists believe that philosophers should even exist? Hey, you're messing with my job. <laughs> well, you, you, you talked about, uh, was it uh, Lintruccia saying, you know, uh, talking about exercising power for the purpose of social change. Is, mm. is that the job of a philosopher now? to teach others how to do that? Yeah, good question. So <clears throat> if, as a philosopher, you go through all of the big philosophical questions and consistently you reach negative conclusions, um, and you're a smart person, you've done your homework, and you think that the collective work of all philosophers is to reach negative conclusions on all of these things, then, it sounds like it makes sense for philosophers just to close up shop <laughs> and say this is pointless and go right, do various other things. Now there is a tradition in uh, the history of philosophers for many philosophers to do just that. So in ancient philosophy there, was, uh, there were skeptics and one of the, 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 the charmingly consistent philosophers was a guy named Cratylus 
who uh, reached some skeptical conclusions where he said, you know, I ultimately think that all of these words and theories that I'm coming up with are ultimately meaningless and that language doesn't really serve any sort of a communicative function. So he decided, actually, as a matter of principle, to shut up for the rest of his life. And he just didn't shut, <laughs> didn't talk anymore. That's right. So that's the cradleless option. Yeah. And you might then say, well, yes, actually, please, postmodernists, do shut up. Right? Uh, be consistent. Right? If you really believe that words and concepts are meaningless, then don't try to use them. So it seems like they are trying to use the words and then at the same time disavow that the words have some meaning. Now, what uh, many of the postmodernists will do is when they're playing around with language, they'll use various clever devices where they will use the word and put it in quotation marks, and that's a way of using it, but at the same time distancing. Or they will put a word right on the page, and they know that you will read the word, but they will cross the word out. Again, you know, use it, but not use it at the same time. And that's something that comes out of Wittgenstein, but uh, Derrida would use that right, a lot. Now, David Hume was uh, one of the great skeptics in, uh, in modern philosophy. Uh, he uh, came out of a certain tradition following Locke that led to Berkeley and Hume, so he's typically seen as a third generation empirical philosopher. But uh, you know, as philosophers do, they pick apart the theories of the previous generation and early Empirical philosophy had some weaknesses in it. By the time it got to the generation of Hume, those had been widely exposed. And so one of the things Hume had said was, uh, you know, I've done all this philosophy and all, all these issues. I think uh, you know, we're not going to figure them out. All of the theories are false. And so basically his answer was to say, well, look, philosophy really is just kind of useless. So just uh, don't think about stuff. Just kind of get on with your life and just, just do whatever. And so. Uh, go with your passions in, in some sense. Now, he was a nice Scottish man, so his idea of going with your passions wasn't you know, storm and drang and rage and, and smash the machine, so he thought civilized people where it wouldn't be so bad. Now, just to uh, just throw one more anecdote out here, Richard Rorty, I think, is also following in the path that you're talking about. He was a long time philosopher working at Princeton University, working in the trenches of analytic philosophy. And he wrote a, a book that I think was is brilliant, as much as I disagree with it, published in 1979, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. And it's a march through basically the entire history of analytic philosophy and how it led to the collapse of logical positivism and uh, neo-pragmatism and so forth. Um, and so he says, yeah, the entire modern philosophy project has been a failure, and he did then say, as the quotation, uh, the quotation I quoted earlier said, said, okay, no point to being a philosopher anymore. So he left the philosophy department at Princeton and moved to a comparative literature program at the University of Virginia and said, you know, we're going to work with the poets. And so he is saying, in effect, everything that we do is just literature. And the distinction between fiction and nonfiction doesn't make any sense. And so we tell stories, we do narratives, and I'm just interested in rhetoric. But rhetoric without the idea that my language is communicatory or that I'm trying to get you to believe certain facts about the world. So yes, absolutely, that's the question that needs to be thought about. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, it's Liz, and I've got a couple of short comments that I'm inviting, not so much questions, but inviting your response on. Um, it seems that there's a lot of, and I, my comments might be come from a more political angle, but it seems like there's a lot of trickery going on. Now, of course, I, that would invite a fairly biased accusation, <laughs> accusation of bias, but um, it, it, it does, like one of the things you said um, when you were uh, speaking, Stephen, about um, that there is some uh, objectivity reserved when they go through some special level of objectivity when they go through some long process and that. And I thought, well, isn't that something like one example could be like, well, even under the, if I may say so, guise um, of academia, you know, the peer review process, that could be easily manipulated and can be easily ma manipulated and, and um, or coerced. Um, and if so, or with that, wouldn't that indicate 
actually a meta, I'll call it a meta conformity. It's kind of, kind of like, can we search for use the group power, the people running, sort of driving the group think, um, using them or allowing them to sort of come to a desired conclusion. Mm. And, and like so what I'm trying in, to say even is... even in the sciences. Yeah. The the, is sure. Isn't it that, that deep and the trickery, yeah. what I'll just call in plain words, trickery? Right. Yeah. So if I'm taking your question right correctly, the, one of the great claims then for objectivists, your small o objectivists, are those who believe that reason is efficacious and that with doing the hard work, even on complex matters, we can have it the least highly probable hypotheses or even achieve certainty that all of the elements of the scientific method can be gamed by yes. those who are engaging in trickery. And so the peer review process is, is going to be an example of that. So what does it mean that something has gone through the peer review process? Well, it might mean that just the peer review process is a, is, a, is a sham and the editors have chosen peer reviewers who are supposed to be anonymous, but he already knows what the peer reviewers are going to say. Mm -hmm. And so it's a rubber stamping, but you're just going through the process, right? Or much of what happens uh, in, uh, in peer review is what we call the, the reviewer two process uh, uh, result, where you typically send a journal article or a ma book manuscript out to, to two reviewers, and the editor is going to rely on them to give an objective evaluation of the text. But reviewer two just says, you know, I don't like the conclusion of this paper, so I'm just going to find some reason to to, uh, to, to, to to dismiss it, right, and so forth. And so the, the author of the paper will get back the comments and can recognize it. The, the, the reviewer hasn't really taken the argument seriously, has just for political reasons. So yes, gaming is, is, a, is a big problem. So then the question is going to be, can the advocates of the objectivity find ways to reform that process, right, and so forth. So that's the ongoing, the ongoing problem. And of course, the other, the other thing is if we think of all of the rubber meets the road science issues, so we're all interested in climate change, is it real or not, and to what degree, right, and so forth. Well, how much of that is a pure scientific process and how much of it is driven by politics, right, or uh, transgender issues, uh, how much of that is driven by actual biology and informed psychology and how much of it as a matter of uh, perhaps wishful thinking psychology and so on. So yes, great challenges there. Yeah, Stephen, um, Michael here. Um, look, I just wanted to reflect this. So um, you started off talking about, in a way, in my words, our sort of animal nature, our passionate you know, tendency towards um, perhaps selfishness and to commit um, kind of uh, sins, if you like, um, you know, stealing, uh, murder, revenge, all that sort of stuff. So and I think reflecting on our own sense of self, there, there's a truth in that. You know, we, we are, you know, sometimes selfish, sometimes greedy, etc. And then the, you talked about collectivism um, and the influence of groups and peer pressure and that sort of thing. And I think we all can accept that there's a truth in that too. So what I'm thinking of the individualism, you know, that came out of the Enlightenment was was kind of like a project, you know, and, and the novel, I suppose, was the great, you know, new literary form that gave expression to it. There's this, this notion of the individual is not something that, you know, springs into being at birth, but something that is a project for each of us to kind of overcome, you know, our animal nature and, and influences of family and all that sort right, of stuff. Right. And that postmodernism seems to be like a giving up on that project. Yeah, nicely said, yes. Okay. Yeah, so what he said. <laughs> There was a question over, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Dr. Dr. Hicks, I was really excited when you brought up Mussolini, uh, because years ago when I was in high school, that was uh, something that really struck me when I was studying European history. It really influenced my uh, interpretation of the conventional political spectrum. Just being able to hop from the far left to the far right, mm. there's something um, strange with that, and that stuck with me. 
Um, so it's excited when you brought it up. My question is, are we witnessing a Mussolini, <laughs> Mussolini shift in socialism as a result of the postmodernist pro project? Class, <clears throat> class to tribe, um, setting the stage possibly for repeating the mistakes of the past. Yes, all right, good historically informed question. Uh, yeah, I'm torn about it a couple of ways of, because that's, that's a rich question. All right, so do I, do I start in the 20th century or do I start now and go backwards? Right. It is interesting if you look just journalistically now at the so-called far left activists and the far right activists. And then you say, what's the difference between those two? Because they all show up in uniforms, they're all angry, they all want to destroy stuff, they're not interested in discussion and debate, and they all seem to have different collectives in stake, whether it's a kind of a group racial thing or some sort of group economic thing and so forth. So yes. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's interesting is Mussolini is a good example. But if you go also into the 1920s, uh, there were individuals like Carl Schmitt, who was a German jurisprudential thinker, probably the most influential academic on the development of national socialist political legal ideology in the 1920s and a gung-ho Nazi himself. Now here's a man who in the 1920s, he's brilliant, um, but when you get to the 1990s, 2000s, uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, fall of the Soviet Union, is thinkers who are on the far left of the spectrum, who think of themselves as postmoderns, starting to cite Carl Schmitt respectfully and to incorporate Schmittian doctrines into their new postmodern left advocacy. So there's a merger then between far right apparently and far left. Another name here that's an important one is uh, uh, Martin Heidegger. And we'll have something a little bit. Every single leading postmodernist, Richard Rorty. When Richard Rorty says the three big philosophers in his thinking, John Dewey was one of them, uh, Wittgenstein, another, the, the later Wittgenstein, not the earlier Wittgenstein, and Martin Heidegger as fundamental. You know, Rorty is a man of the far left. Heidegger was a Nazi. Now, brilliant philosopher in the 1920s in Germany. That's saying a lot. Germany was the most advanced philosophical nation. Getting a PhD from a German university in the 1920s or the teens, that's a high watermark. And Heidegger was recognized as the shining star in the German philosophical temperament or, or firmament. And gung ho Nazi in his political philosophy. Gung-ho to the point where uh, <laughs> he becomes appointed uh, chancellor at his university, or sorry, rector at his university, and he gives a speech, and it's a call to, uh, to, to Nazify the university. And he's signing on for purges of Jewish, uh, Jewish professors and nonconformist uh, professors and so forth. So this is a, you know, as, gung-ho Nazi as you can possibly get, but also strongly influential on the leading, apparently far-left postmodern thinkers as well. So uh, when we are rethinking the political lexicon, it's very comfortable to say there's left and right and put it on a one-dimensional spectrum. And I remember being taught this when I went off to university. You know, at the far left, you've got someone like Marx and Stalin. You know, and at the far right, you've got someone like Hitler. Right? And uh, I, I can remember just as an 18-year-old freshman, thinking, you know, that doesn't really make sense to me. But that was what every single one of my teachers were teaching me. That's the, the political spectrum. And I'm trying to think, okay, so where do you put Thomas Jefferson? Or where do you put, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln? You know, a compromise between Marx and Hitler? You know, t you know, taking taking a little bit from Stalin, a little bit from uh, no. It seems like that you know that those, those are authoritarians and collectivists, and some sort of individualist and liberal that has to be some sort of other dimension. So, 
you know, as modern and sophisticated as I think we are, I think we still are captured by very primitive understandings of the political landscape. Last one. One more? Thanks. Okay. Hello. Um, yes, thank you. Um, you Press Hicks, you mentioned a couple of times, you referred to the biblical text as uh, pre-modern. Yeah. And, I, and I get that. You know, they're pre-modern. They're not Enlightenment. They're not Renaissance, particularly. Um, but I see a continuity, and I, just, I was wondering if you'd like to comment on, the, on, on biblical thinking and, and the way that certain members of the church... Uh, approach life and man's nature and free will and anti-slavery, I see a continuity, but, uh, 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 you know, uh, with biblical literature and approaching the modern era. So, for instance, I think in the first, by, by 400 AD, once the Christi Christianity had spread through the Roman Empire, I'm not a Christian, by the way, but I've just been studying this stuff, uh, slavery was just about completely eliminated. Now, it came back later, not because of Christianity, but because of other factors like the, um, the jihad that started after uh, Islam began. But that's what I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in understanding that. that, that is, is the, are, are the biblical text stories and uh, church uh, history, is that pre-modern in the sense of preparing us for the modern? Mm. Or just before? And, and with a continuity. Whereas yeah. postmodernism seems to be discontinuous with the biblical modern uh, 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 timeline. Yeah. Postmodernism seems to be in a different direction of a different nature and character. Yeah. I find that odd. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great question and kind of a full day seminar, right, uh, right all in itself, because what you're, what you're asking is uh, right, interpretation of church and biblical history, and as we know, we can go on for a long. So right, my, my view is that, uh, um, as we know, in the Bible, you can find support for a lot of different positions. And so the question then is going to be what your interpretation says is the dominant set of traditions. And uh, I'm not going to prejudge anyone who says, I think this passage in scripture is the most important one and all of the other conflicting passages need to be de-emphasized because of this one compared to someone who wants to say, no, this is the right passage and this one has to, has to, give, uh, has to give way. So I am fully uh, uh, cognizant. I mean, you mentioned the 400s. This is, of course, the big issue that the Christians themselves had been grappling with all through the 300s and on into the 400s after Constantine, con Constantine converted and he convenes the Council of Nicaea and uh, in the 320s and he's saying, look, uh, we were all think of ourselves as Christianity, but there are at least five or six different versions of Christianity kicking around. We all, they all conflict with each other. And Constantine eventually gives the, the bishops and others uh, marching orders, figure out what Christianity stands for, what the right interpretation is, and what are the heretical interpretations. And all of them are represented in the, the 300s at that point. So you do have those who want to say, look, if you are going to be a proper Christian, you have to argue that this world is created by God uh, as a place where uh, the great moral testing ground is going to happen. And that God created human beings, but he created them distinctively with free will, with moral agency, and he gave them a certain set of rules. And what he's doing is observing what we do with our free agency so that he can judge us in the afterlife and the good people will go to heaven and the bad. And that's a perfectly Christian story and it redounds through the centuries. But equally so, there's a good Christian argument that can be made for saying, God, if we're going to be Christian, we have to understand that God is infinite in all of his dimensions and that God's being infinite in all of his dimensions means that God is infinitely powerful. And if God is infinitely powerful, then that means he has all of the power. And that means that human beings don't have any power because free will is a kind of power, it's a kind of agency. I have a certain amount of power to change the future, you have power to change your future and so forth, but to the extent that millions of us each have our own locuses of power, well, it can't be the case that God has all of the power. So that then implies that if you really want to insist on God's infinity and his omnipotence, then you have to deny that human beings have free will 
and that means you have to deny that human beings have moral agency. And there is an orthodox position that can go down that line. So uh, short answer to your question is all of the issues that we have started to put on the table and some of the ones that you mentioned yourself, absolutely right, those are, those are in the corner. And some of them are going to be continuous with modernism. Some of them, though, will be ones that did become orthodox in the Christian tradition that the moderns had to break with and rebel against. So it's going to be a split decision. The slavery one is very interesting just because I don't, uh, correct me if I am wrong, but I don't think there's a single place in the Bible that has anything negative to say about slavery. And that's interesting. There are lots of positive things to say that slaves should obey their masters. And there are some responsibilities that masters have and limits to what masters can do to their slaves, but there's nothing on principle against slavery. But you're right, when Christian orthodoxy swept the Roman world, one of the reforms that they introduced was an attack on slavery. Well, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, there is an answer to that. So, the, yeah, so the question is whether it's, it's scriptural or whether there are some things that are in the spirit of scripture and are going to then be interpreted by Christians and, and, and applied, right, and so on. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes session two. Okay. All right, let's have lunch.